Hello and welcome to my overview of romanticism. First and foremost, when we're talking about the romantic era, we aren't using the word romantic as an adjective. So you might think red roses, candlelit dinners. We're not using it as an adjective in this context. We're actually referring to the word romantic as an abstract noun. So these are words that aren't concrete. So a noun typically would be phone, whiteboard, in this context, it's an abstract noun. So the romantic era is a movement. Other examples of um, abstract nouns could be things like beauty. It's a nameable thing, but we can't see and touch it or even democracy. So when we're saying romanticism, we're not thinking of that romantic sense of the word. We're actually talking about an artistic and intellectual movement that originated in Europe towards the end of the 18th century. So if we're studying Mary Shelley and Frankenstein, we might say phrases like the romantic era, romanticism, or the romantic movement. I might even call myself a capital R romantic, which means I'm somebody um, who, who um, values these ideas and beliefs. So let's get a clear definition. So it's an artistic, literary, musical, and intellectual celebration of the individual. Romantics, capital R, had an interest in intense emotions such as fear, horror, terror, and awe, especially that experienced in confronting what they called the sublime, so the beauty and the power of nature. Romanticism in many ways can be seen as a revolt against the aristocratic social and political norms of the Age of Enlightenment. This was a time that valued reason and logic and this movement was also, can also be seen as a reaction against the Industrial Revolution, which was happen happening simultaneously. So as you can see, there's a lot of overlapping um, social movements that are shaping the Romantics at this time. Number one, an interest in the common man and childhood. So Romantics believed in the natural goodness of humans, which they felt is hindered by urbanization and civilization. This belief was based on the works of on the work of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a Genevan philosopher, and sometimes he's considered the father of Romanticism. And central to Rousseau's worldview was the idea that humankind is good by nature, but it is society that corrupts it. Similarly, we also have the English philosopher John Locke, who compared, compared the mind at birth to a tabula rasa which is Latin for a blank slate, upon which our experiences imbue reason and knowledge. In modern terms, these ideas are sometimes associated with that concept of nature versus nurture. Jean-Jacques Rousseau even said, God makes all things good, man meddles with them and they become evil. In the context of Frankenstein, this idea is explored by Mary Shelley with her characterization of the creature she prompts readers to consider, is the creature actually born good and he becomes evil as a result of society? Or as Victor would possibly argue, is the creature just born evil? The creature even says to Victor, I am malicious because I am miserable. And he asks this great question, shall I respect man when he condemns me? And he also says, Am I to be thought the only criminal when all humankind has sinned against me? Why should I play by your rules when you have shunned me and scorned me, essentially? Notice here we've also got the, the value of childhood. So note that the Industrial Revolution is happening at this time, and this is a time which is dominated by exploitation of coal and iron, and in which, sadly, child labour was a common feature often involving children suffering under horrible circumstances. Think of them in huge factories, up chimneys, and doing generally quite horrendous labor. Opposing this, the Romantics abhorred this treatment of uh, children and viewed childhood really um, as something quite close to God and therefore something we should protect and nurture. In fact, William Blake, one of the earliest Romantic period writers, wrote many poems that critiqued child labour in London at the time and how it damages our innocence and our health. And he was known for this kind of political and religious dissent. He actually really did call out the church directly, the king as well, and even parents 
for their role in contributing to the inhumane treatment of children. In the novel, while Victor experiences a very um, privileged childhood, it's interesting that he notes that his parents idolised him and treated them as his plaything, a very gorgeous, safe upbringing that he had. It's interesting that he doesn't offer the creature this same privilege. In fact, just completely deserts him and neglects him. Number two is intuition rather than deduction. It's interesting, as I noted before, that while the scientific revolution and enlightenment valued logic and reason, the uh, romantics were led more so by emotion. So when we think of Frankenstein, it's interesting at first he is driven by um, a strong scientific desire to figure out where life comes from. By the end of the novel, he is warning Walton, Ca Captain Robert Walton, to of the dangers of acquiring knowledge and finally does advise him to seek happiness in tranquility and to avoid ambition. Next up, we have awe of nature. So romantics stressed an awe of nature in their art and language. They use this term sublime to refer to art that has the ability to terrify or overwhelm the viewer. Think of it as a meeting of the emotional and the natural world. A time when we allow our emotions to overwhelm our rationality as we experience the wonder of creation. A fantastic painting to see this sublime nature in is by Caspar David Friedrich and it's his painting Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog. Possibly this is a self-portrait, but it's an image of self-reflection and contemplation of life's path and beauty. It's set in a wild, isolated, natural landscape. And we, the viewer, are sort of positioned to become the wanderer as well with him and to consider our own life as we ponder this beautiful view. In the novel, you won't be surprised that Mary Shelley does spend a lot of time describing sublime nature and powerful natural landscapes. She literally uses the phrase sublime shapes of the mountains to describe the mountains around, um, Victor's, around Victor's home. Next, we have number four, the celebration of the individual. So the romantics asserted the importance of the individual, the unique, the outcast, the eccentric, and they often elevated the achievements of the misunderstood heroic individual outcast. They also had a deep interest in Greek mythology. And this is because Greek figures um, are usually abundant in fantasy and adventure and powerful symbolism. This is why we have Mary Shelley have the alternate title Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. A lot of romantic writers were interested in biblical allusions, allusions to um, Greek mythology, um, and other romantic writers at the time. These romantics loved spontaneity and individualism. They really liked freedom from rules. Excellent. And finally, we come to the importance of imagination. So imagination to the, to the romantics act, acted really as a source of creativity. They believed that it allowed us to see what is not immediately apparent. The Romantics believed we could discover the imagination in nature, which often resulted in a harmony of the two. Characters' thoughts, feelings, inner struggles, opinions, dreams, passions and hopes reign supreme in the Romantic era, and they don't allow for facts or truth to inhibit them from expressing imaginative ideas, especially as they relate to nature. This is why you get some incredible paintings of things that aren't actually very plausible. So you've got Henry Fuseli's The Nightmare, where we've got a woman splayed across um, a bed with um, a demonic, um, I think it's a um, incubus, sitting on top of her with a white-eyed horse hauntingly looking over her. Is it plausible? Would the scientists believe in, go in, in dreams? Probably not. But nonetheless, it evokes fear. It evokes um, also beauty at the same time, the nightmare. This is why you've also got um, uh, the Raft of Medusa painting, where we have people shipwrecked and um, holding on to, to, for dear life, waiting to be rescued. And the romantics in this importance of imagination 
really valued aesthetic beauty. And that's why you've got shipwrecked people who are actually quite buff and beautiful, even though they haven't eaten in 13 days and apparently did resort to cannibalism whilst waiting for their rescue. Another painting we've looked at in class is George Stubbs's series of um, horses being frightened by lions. Very unlikely meeting to have horses meet lions, but nonetheless, he paints these uh, natural landscapes where it's happening, often at night time and often with the horse looking extremely fearful. So we have this idea of the grotesque and fearful also being quite beautiful in these works. Mm -hmm.